2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 6. The Bible says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but without labor, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now we had to read a couple of verses today. It may take us a while to eventually arrive at the thought, but we had to read all these verses to get the context. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, and really, chapter number one, he's given them basically an update on what's happened with him since the last time that he was in Thessalonica. Chapter number two has to deal with the rapture and how some people in Paul's day had been teaching that the rapture had already done happened, that we were in the last times already. Well, if you go read and study chapter number two, you're going to find out rapture hadn't happened yet. He says that there's still a couple of things that had to happen for them, and there's one thing that we're still waiting on that hadn't come to fruition. What's that? That, by the grace of God, he's decided that he's not going to have the rapture yet. All right, he's waiting on something to get in. Right, until the Antichrist comes on the scene, rapture not going to... I mean, he said... Right? Rapture will happen when it's time for the Antichrist to be revealed. That, that, not today. How do you know? Church still here. Anyway. Uh, chapter 3. He deals with, starting at verse number 6, and before this there was a little bit that he was covering, but then don't have time to get through everything, so we had to pick and choose. Okay, starting at verse number 6. He says... Right now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a suggestion. The Apostle Paul talks earlier in this book about how the church of Thessalonica had done very well in not only receiving, but repeating and instilling in others, indoctrinating, the commandments that the Holy Ghost and God had given to the Apostle Paul to give to the church. He says, what you learned, you've done well. He said, you haven't turned from it. You received it as what it really was, the Word of God. He said you didn't see it as an opinion of Paul or Silas or Timothy, you know, whoever it was that came by their way to preach to him. He said you received it as the Word of God, as a true commandment. And then in chapter number 3 he says, but we have a new commandment. He says, this I command you. Right, and if we're honest, this isn't new as in... The Apostle Paul just came up with it on the day that he was writing down this letter. Okay, this principle goes throughout the Bible. But, he says it was new for them. He says, I have a new commandment for you. He says, you've done well with everything that we've received. So here's another one. He says, one more thing to work on, to keep in mind. To preserve and to instill in the next generation. Okay, he says, not by himself, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. He says, being disorderly is a problem. He doesn't say to kill those that are disorderly. Hallelujah. But he's not saying to ostracize. He just says withdraw from them. You know what that word withdraw means? It just means separate yourself. Doesn't mean to leave them stranded on the side of the road. That word withdraw has the connotation, don't let their disorderliness affect you. 
I mean, we, we all know the phrase, misery loves company. Right? If you're miserable, you want other people to be around you so that they too will become miserable. If you're disorderly, guess what you want? You want somebody to cut loose and be disorderly with you. Right? Whether we realize it or not, either we're having an impact on somebody else or they're impacting us. Either they see something in us that causes them to either change what they're doing or continue on what they're doing, make that decision, or because of us being around them, we're going to change the way that we're living. He says disordered breeds disorder. That's, not, that's nothing new. I mean, we can go all the way back to the beginning. Right? Eve's disorder... Guess who that impacted? Adam. And you know why? Because Adam decided he wanted Eve more than he wanted God. I mean, that's what it boils down to. That decision was made to be disorderly. Why? Because God had one order for them. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat everything else, but don't eat that one. There was disorder. Adam didn't want to withdraw himself from disorder, so he made himself a part of the disorder. Okay, well, let's continue. Verse number seven, he says, For your, yourselves know how we ought to, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For ye have behaved, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. He says, You want to know how you ought to act? Act how we acted. He says, do things in order. We showed you what order was. Is it not? Written in the Bible that things of God should be done in decent and in order. That the commandment from God from the beginning has been things of God should be done orderly. Not in confusion. Not in a ruckus. Not haphazardly thrown together and hoping that everything sticks. Right? In order. Things shouldn't be done for convenience. They should be done because they're right. You know what disorder looks like? Disorder is when people come in the door and not talking about people in the crowd. I'm talking the pastor. The people that are sitting there. Nobody knows what's going to happen. If it's disorder, everybody confused. Now let me give you the contrast to that. Not saying everything needs to be scheduled out. Right? There are times that we come in the door and we had all intentions on singing a congregational, but the Holy Ghost show up and congregational never gets sung. That's not disorder. That's just called God changing the plan. Because when the Holy Ghost does it, guess what? Everybody's on the same page. It's orderly. When the Holy Ghost does it, doesn't matter who's singing. All that matters is that Holy Ghost wants you to do something. It's time to do it. Whatsoever he said, do it. Then I promise you, if the Holy Ghost tells you to do it, it's never out of order. Don't know where that came from, but you're welcome. Okay, he said, do what you learned to us. Now around here, we know what it is to be in order. Right? Every now and then, something around here, you know, it's not very often. I'm talking like, Oh, hang on a second here. I got to go back in my mind and figure out how long that. Last one I can remember is about a year and a half. Right? Something crazy off the wall happened. Guess what? Pastor shut it down. Y'all may not have recognized it, but growing up, I knew what happened. Right? I saw what, what something disorderly is about ready to happen. Pastor shut it down. Didn't happen. Okay? Hallelujah. We got a man of God like that that's got enough discernment that when God says, hey, we don't need none of that, he kills it. Okay, but doesn't happen much around here. You know what the point is? When it comes to the things of God, do what you've seen around here. We've been instructed well. We've had good examples of people that just want to come in and worship God. We've got good examples of people that when they go out into the community, they behave orderly. Right? They live their life with God first in their conscience rather than everything else in the world. That's what the Apostle Paul said. 
He said, we weren't perfect, but we behaved ourselves orderly. He said, we did everything above board. Well, why? Well, he goes on to say, in, I think it's verse number 10, yeah, for when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat, for we hear there are some of you which walk disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. He says, this is what you've become. Not all of them. He says, there are some. Well, in verse number 9, he says, you know why we acted the way we acted? He says, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an end sample unto you to follow us. He said, we never asked anything of anybody. Verse number 8, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. He's using the most basic form of order which is if you eat you should have done something to deserve to eat right you, if you're a child you get food given to you but once you grow up you got to do something to earn the bread they say we didn't walk around with our hand out saying we're the men of God you got to feed us no he said that they labored and travailed night and day Go read the book of Acts. You're going to find there are days that the Apostle Paul's mending tents. Putting tents together. Why? Because it was something that he could do. Apostle Paul's a smart man. I'm sure he could have figured out how to do a lot of things. But he went around and he found somebody that had a need. And he said, I'll do that. And labor, travail so that somebody else doesn't have to give me food to eat but I can earn food to eat other times you'll see him mending fishing nets right? everywhere that they went he found something to do right? God made a way that there was a place that he could labor in order to earn his meals he said did we have to do that no he said we did it to become an end sample unto you he said, we were there on the most important business that there could be. That was God's business. But he said, Jesus took fish out of water, and there's money in the fish in order to pay taxes. He fed 5,000 on a hillside one day with a few loaves and a few fishes. He said, God could have fed us if he wanted to, but he said, we became end samples or examples of how to behave yourself orderly. He says, it's never orderly to take from somebody else what you're capable of doing for yourself. That's the principle that he's getting at. It is disorderly, right, or it's not right. That's what order means it's right. Disorderly means it's not right. It's, he says it's right that if you expect food, you expect to work in order to earn it. He said it doesn't matter what you are capable of doing doesn't matter how much you're capable of doing he just as the point is is that you put in the effort he doesn't say that in order to you know he doesn't say that if a man doesn't complete this every day he doesn't deserve to eat no the key word there is just work right do what you're capable of doing you may not be able to do as some as much as somebody else you may be able to do more than somebody else doesn't matter do what you can do Right? Well, I don't like doing that. Well, if that's what's available to do, do it. Right? Do you want to eat? That's what's wrong with my generation. They got all the jobs out there in the world. Right? Openings everywhere, but oh no, I won't do that job. You know why they won't do that job? They haven't gotten hungry yet. You don't know why they won't take this job or that job? Because somebody's pampered them too long hadn't kicked them out of the nest and they don't know what it is to need because if you need you'll do something and I remember stories from that I've heard during the Great Depression right where grown men would wait for hours all day in line just to get enough bread and cheese to take home to their family because unemployment lines were literally city blocks long there were no jobs and then, I'm not saying that I agree with the policy that was enacted, 
But the government did make some jobs. The, you anybody ever heard of TVPA, Tennessee Valley Protection Act? Right, where they started building dams and waterways and everything. But you see, that job wasn't just around the corner from everybody. There were men that literally uprooted their life, left their family behind, and went halfway across the country to build dams out of concrete and everything else, working night and day. Why did they do that? Because they needed to do it. They were compensated, but it wasn't easy. They didn't want to do it, I'm sure. But I don't know what all goes into building a dam, but I'm sure it's not a pleasant experience. I'm sure it's not always the, uh, back in the day they didn't have OSHA, so I'm sure it wasn't the safest operation, blowing concrete and, I mean, blowing rocks and dynamite and everything else out of the way in order to get stuff out of the way so that you could put the dam in. Right? And not to mention that if something cracks, guess what's coming through the wall? A whole lot of water, and it's washing you away. Right? Not saying it was the most desirable job in the world, but you know why men did it? Because they needed to. Do you know why people that work, work? Because they need to. It's not a question of, I want to. It's a question of, it needs to be done. So I'm going to do it. Right? Now, fortunately... We all pulled around the room today. Right? God's blessed us all with employment that we do enjoy. Right? God's given us a way to provide for our needs, but at the same time, it's not a place where we're miserable every day. Right? Now, just hold that in the back of your mind. We gotta keep going. Okay, but the point is he's saying we were examples. The apostle Paul, I guarantee you, would have much rather been preaching somewhere than sitting there mending nets are so intense together I promise you that but you know why he did it because he knew people were watching him he knew that he would be an end sample and he didn't want to be chargeable is the word that he used in our text towards any of them meaning that somebody else would be able to say well you were capable of doing it but you took it from me instead that, that would have tarnished not only his reputation but that would have tarnished the entire purpose or the impact of the gospel in that area. Everybody looked at him and said, that guy's just a freeloader. Well, verse number 11, he says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Well, as I was reading this, it just hit me. A busybody is somebody that is busy but never getting anything done. Look, Working not at all, but are busybodies. He said some are working, but some are busybodies. You know what work accomplishes? Something gets done. Right? If you're working, something's accomplished. He says, but some are busybodies. You know what that means? They're not accomplishing nothing. They're busy, but they're not doing anything. There's no point. There's no end result of what it is that they're doing. Then he goes on to say, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Then he goes on to say, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. He says some people are working. Other people are spending all their effort and energy doing something. But instead of laboring, what are they doing? They're running around and checking to make sure everybody else is working. They're checking to see if this person did as much as the other person. The Apostle Paul says, hey, knock all that off. He says, get to work or go hungry. That's what he says. Well, <coughs> he goes on to say, but ye, brethren, who's that? That's those that aren't busybodies. He says, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well doing. He says, I know that there are those that are disorderly. He says, they're running around, they're trying to stick their nose in your business, and that keeps you from being able to work as well as you would uh, you know, want to. There's nothing that I hate more than somebody who has no business talking to me, doesn't want to talk about that. They just don't want to do their job, so they come over and talk to me, trying to distract themselves for a while. It drives me up the wall. I'm trying to get something done. Go waste your own time. 
That, now, if it's somebody that I do do business with, and they come up and ask me a question, or they're like, hey, you remember when we did this? That's still working. That's getting something done. I'm talking about busybodies. Somebody that wants to make it look like they're doing something to the boss man, but all they're doing is wasting both of our times. Right? Those people get on my nerves. Why? Because I was in the middle of something, and the way my brain works, until I get it done, it's all I can think about. Right? I'm chomping at the bit to get back to what I was doing. Right? I want to throw things at them and tell them to go away, but apparently you can't do that. That's in the employee handbook. You have to be courteous to others. Right? But, he says, ye brethren, be not weary in well doing. He says, I know you're working. He says, and I know that there are busybodies. He says, but don't let the busybodies get you so far down that you stop working. He says, there's always going to be distractions. There's always going to be things that are inconvenient, either in the flesh or to your schedule, or it may be inconvenient because of the time of day that it happens. Right? It's never convenient for somebody to get sick. It's never convenient for somebody to have a tragedy happen in their family. Right? It's never convenient for you to be asked to do something above what you normally do. Because you know what convenient means? That it's easy. He didn't promise that the work would be easy. He just promised that there would be work. There's always something to do. Jesus said the fields are white under harvest. There's plenty to be done. But he says, I promise you there's going to be plenty of inconveniences. Plenty of distractions. Plenty of people trying to throw stumbling blocks out in front of you. He says, just keep working. He says, you know what the best thing you can do when life gets distracting? Just keep your nose down. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And keep heading in that direction. He said, it, some days may go slower than others. That there may be a few speed bumps along the way. Or like I found out after we had all that ice and snow and the plows finally came through and got all the rest of it off of the roads. Right, there were some new potholes on my way to work. Right, because the snow plows came through and there was some ice and there was some snow that had stuck its way down into that blacktop and guess where the blacktop went? It went with the snow and the ice. Well, guess what I found out? When it's filled with water and it's a little early in the morning, it still looks like blacktop, but when you hit it, it's not blacktop. Big thud. Didn't blow a tire out or nothing. But big thud. Right, that wasn't convenient. In fact, for a second, I thought that my tire had blown, and I'm thinking, oh, no, I do not want to change the tire right now out in the middle of the 12-degree weather that we have right now. Didn't want to do it. Well, thankfully, didn't have to. Right? But that wasn't convenient. It's not convenient swerving all the potholes in the road when you're headed to work. It's not convenient that every time you sit down to read your Bible that the phone rang or that... You remember that there was something you were supposed to do earlier or as you're trying to concentrate, you just can't get everything to happen throughout the day off of your mind where you can actually pay attention. It's not convenient, but the work needs to be done. He says, don't grow weary. You know when distractions become a problem or inconveniences become a problem? When you spend more of your time thinking about that than you do the work. Let's be honest. Some people in here are very safe. When they drive and the phone rings, they ignore it. Okay, I, I imagine that there are very few of those people in this room. But if the phone rings, some people ignore it. They don't let it have an impact on what they're doing right now. Right? Other people will swerve through three lanes of traffic trying to reach into the seat to get to the phone in order to answer it. And then other people have this thing on the steering wheel that they know if they hit it, it'll answer the phone, but they never figured out how to use it, so then they spend 30 seconds hitting every button on the steering wheel, and they're still not looking at the road while they're driving. But what are we saying? Some people get the work done. 
other people get distracted and all they can think about is this instead of what's going on in front of them and then other people still are trying to do what they're supposed to be doing but their attention's drawn away from it well how do you know that because they're looking at the steering wheel hitting all the buttons right trying to figure it out like a playstation controller it's not that easy there's a little phone thing and it's green if you hit that one you're good and then there's one next to it it's red if you hit that one it makes the phone stop ringing well what's the point that's how life is some days you're able to keep driving just tune everything else out you're able to say we'll get to that here in a bit that's not important right now because whether or not you realize that you're driving a 2,000 pound bullet and it's more important to keep that thing in control than it is to answer the phone other people could care less about the responsibility that they have for not killing people when they're driving down the road and they want to answer the phone I, I promise you it can wait but in some people's minds oh, this is more important or just as important and then other people know that they're supposed to be doing this still so they're, they're trying their best but they're also trying to do this at the same time and guess what they're not doing either one of them when the distractions and when the inconveniences of life when they get you so weary that you start paying more attention to this you just want this to go away then this is all that you're thinking about the difference between overwhelmed and keep working it's not the distractions because I promise you even on the days that you plow through and you feel like you had a great day guess what you had plenty of distractions you just didn't pay attention to them they didn't have control over you you were able to look at them and say okay I understand that this is a part of the day now but we're still going to get this done then there are days that you're juggling and you're trying to do everything at once and guess what you don't get the distractions resolved and you don't get the work resolved and you're just left there with both pots empty and then there are days that you say we're just going to get all these distractions out of the way so that tomorrow we'll be able to get the work done guess what there's going to be more distractions tomorrow he says that's disorderly it's disorderly trying to do two things at once because you're not going to do either one orderly he says it's disorderly to stop working to try and take care of all this other business when you know that this is what you should be doing he says it's orderly to put those things first which are most important get those done and then deal with the rest of it later but when weary really means is that we get tired of everything else that we stop doing the work he says weary and well doing we know that what we're doing is important it's well doing we're doing well for others for ourselves for the cause of Christ he says it's the right thing to do we know that we don't get weary of doing the right thing we get weary of everything that gets in the way of us doing the right thing he says when these distractions get so a hold of your mind and your heart and your attention that you want to deal with these things more most of the time you don't want to deal with it because you like it you want to deal with it so they just go away well guess what it's going to be replaced by something else the world your flesh the devil they're never going to run out of ammunition on things that can dishearten you and get your attention away from the fact that you're doing good work it's work that's so important that God gave it to you to do right? he said it means so much to me that I'm the one that picked the work that figured everything out for you right all I want you to do is be faithful to do it that may not be the best reference for everybody but the movie Blues Brothers we're on a mission from God right that's what your work is God entrusted it to you certainly it's good work because he promised he's doing a whole lot more work than we were he just expects our faithfulness let's be honest we love doing things for the Lord we love being involved in the things of the Lord but what keeps us from doing it distractions and really they're only distracting when they make such an impact on us that we get emotionally attached to getting them things resolved 
when all along should be water off a duck's back right this gets done first then this right, well we said all that talk about the concept right we talked about food we talked about the labor of the Lord right working you go work a job so that you can have food right God said you're able to work here's the job work it and then he'll provide the food because he provided the money for you even if the money that you don't get from or that you get from the job isn't enough he said that he'd meet all your needs he's just saying you do what you do doesn't ask you to do more than what you can do certainly doesn't expect less he just says do what you can do then we talked about spiritually our responsibilities right God told you to read the Bible as much as you can read not as much as somebody else can read he said pray as much as you can pray don't pray what this person prays or what that person but you pray what you can pray he says take up your cross and follow me it's tailored just for you it's well doing it's worth doing but he says don't get weird just do what you can do because that's what he expects what we can do not more not less but then as I was reading these verses thought eventually got around to disorder at the church house not talking about behavior disorder he says those that work should eat and he said that those that don't work that they're busy bodies well what's a busy body somebody that's in all of your business but doesn't have any business of their own Okay, we're talking about not growing weary and well doing that every man should work now I know we got a great church don't scoff at it in fact you start figuring out how many people do things around the house of God right? you might be a little shocked but guess what I know it's not 100% but what are we saying God said that it's orderly that everyone does something now some people can't you know what they can do? They can pray. They can get on their knees and beg that God give the message to the pastor, or that God put somebody on their heart that they can be a help to them throughout the week. Just call them up and be an encouragement to them so that when they get to the house of God, they got a little bit lighter spirit than maybe they would have had otherwise. That he fitly framed us together. We all have the burden of making sure that when we come to the house of God right one thing is on everybody's mind that's worship now again we've already said we know it's well doing and there are distractions right but I'm just entertain me here humor me for a second wonder what worship would be like if everybody was equally as invested in what goes on at the house of God if everybody made it their responsibility to say Lord what do I need to do to make sure that when church house doors open I'm ready to worship right? I'm not talking about things that are going on around you know cleaning and changing light bulbs and you know making sure that all the batteries have been changed in the microphones because y'all long before you guys are either here or long after you guys have already left Brother Andy's walking around with a pocket full of batteries, swapping them out and everything. But what do you say? I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the labor of being prepared to come in and worship. Now, I'm not so naive to think that some people aren't already doing that. Well, how do you know that? Because God shows up around here more often than not. You know why God does? Because he's honoring the labor of those that have prepared to worship all week, and he just winks at the ignorance and the foolishness of others and he shows up anyway we don't deserve the presence of God but every now and then he just shows up but imagine if everybody was equally committed because according to your Bible guess what it's disorderly if you haven't invested in the worship before you get to the worship hour you know what's orderly that everybody be prepared Apostle Paul said you should know how to possess your vessel in honor you know what that means? 
When you come in, it's spick and span, and you're ready to pour it out to the Lord. Not just to be a pretty vessel, he says, but know how to possess it. That's how to use it. Well, what's a vessel for? For filling up and pouring out. He says, you know what's orderly? That everybody that works gets to eat. Does he? God's long-suffering and he's merciful. And he shows grace. I'm glad on the days that I wasn't prepared to worship that when God showed up, guess what? He let me, you know, get in on the worshiping. But he doesn't have to. Imagine if the only time that you got something out of one of the services was when you were prepared when you walked in and done everything that God had asked you to do throughout the week in order to be ready to worship. Because guess what? The only thing that we deserve is what we've labeled, labored for. He's saying, there's some, they're busybodies. They may be involved in everybody's life, but they haven't done anything to labor for themselves. They may know everybody else's business in the church, but guess what business they haven't tended to? Theirs. It, according to what we just read, that person doesn't deserve to get anything out of the service. You say, that's harsh, Brother George. No, that's the Bible. Do you not do anything on the job all week and expect a paycheck? Do you not pay your bills and still expect the electricity to come on? Do you not put gas in your car and still expect it to run? It may run for a little bit, but guess what? It's running out. And don't do what a lot of idiots do on this one either. Do you not change your oil and just expect it to be there? Right? It's going to gunk up and get so dirty that guess what? Engine going to stop running. What are you saying? There are things that need to be done. It's well doing. Trying to get yourself prepared so that when you come to the house of God, there's nothing between you and God that you would know what God expects of you that day and that you've prepared ahead of time so that you are capable of doing it when you get here. Now, he may not have something for you to do every time you come in the door except sit there and shout the windows out. Right? But other times, he may have burn something in your heart that he wants you to sing a song that he wants you to give testimony that he wants you to get into the altar and pray for this person they may be sitting in the same service with you but he said no get in the altar and start praying for that person I don't know why but I'll pray for him what we get there's well doing to be done not everybody do, does it guess what if not everybody does it that means that there's only so much food to go around. Not because God can't pour it out on us, but because God rewards faithfulness. What did he say? He said it was disorderly. And again, what is disorder? It's wrong. Orderly things are right. Now some people have gotten a routine down. They can come in, they can look all nice, and they can sit there and they can be dignified, and they know when to shout, they know when to raise their hand, and they've got everybody else fooled, but guess what? They're going out empty. Because they didn't come in with anything. They didn't labor throughout the week. God may still touch their heart, they still may get something out of the preaching, but guess what? They're not walking out with much bread. Because you know what the busybodies in this time were eating? They were eating the leftovers of everybody else. Not right, according to your Bible, for a man to rob from his own children to give to a stranger. Right? To take food out of the mouths of the children in order to give it to somebody else. So what's he saying? The labor that's been done for me and those that I'm responsible for, they eat. They're going to get full, and then what's left over, the busybody gets it. By implication, you know what that means? The busybody is not full when they leave. Then they're going to be complaining that they're hungry. Well, then go and do some work. They don't want to do work. They want to be in your work. 
They want to stick their nose in your business. Let's be here. Let's say the brother Ron throws a party, invites everybody over to his house. Okay? He says, everybody bring one thing. One thing of food. Okay. Everybody brings one thing of food. But let's say it was my job to bring all the plates and napkins. If I don't do my job, there's going to be a whole lot of people upset because they're going to be eating with their hands. Right now, if everybody else has to eat with their hands, guess what that means? All the food's there. But I didn't bring the utensils and the plates. Good luck eating soup out of your palm. Right? But everybody else can still eat. But guess what? Do I deserve to eat? There's still food. It's, there's food right there. There's going to be leftover. But I didn't do my part. I brought hardship on everybody else because I didn't bring what I said I was going to bring. Right, well, let's go. What did Christian and Taylor this year had the teens over to their house. They did the, what, what did they call that, the white elephant gift thing. But the whole point of the white elephant is that everybody brings a gift and then it's all randomized and everybody picks one. And then, well, guess what? If you didn't bring one, you don't get to play the white elephant game. Say, well, that's not fair. Yes, it is. Because if they play, that means somebody who brought something's going empty, going away empty handed. And it may be a dumb prank or joke gift. But guess what? That's part of the fun. Right, so why do we expect that if I don't do anything to contribute to the worship throughout the week that I get to walk away with a full plate? I'm stuck with leftovers. Right, and let's be honest. My plate is already full of everybody else's business and all the distractions in the world. I don't have much room for God on my plate if I haven't been preparing to come to worship throughout the week. I'm weary. Why? Because I got all this on my plate. And I haven't been busy doing the well-doing. I'm looking at all of this, and I've got my eyes off of this. It says it's disorderly. In fact, he tells them that if anybody did this in their time, what did he say? He said, withdraw, separate yourself from them. Because their busybodiness, their disorderliness... It's going to have an impact on you. Because all of their distractions come with them. Right? I've got all the distractions that I'm dealing with. But when somebody comes up with all of their distractions, you know what that means? I've got to deal with all their distractions and my distractions. All those inconveniences and things that I wish I didn't have to do, but I've got to deal with them. Well, now... I mean, let's be honest. We all know busybodies. When they come up, they're not talking about their business. They're talking about everybody else's business. Maybe not at the beginning, but eventually. You know why that is? Because they got tired of all of their distractions that they had to go and find some more distractions. And all they're thinking about is other people's problems and what's going on there. So guess what you get when they show up? Everybody's problems. Everybody's distractions. They are the distraction collector. They are a magnet. They suck everybody's distractions to themselves and then they try and take everybody's distractions around to everybody else. I don't care. That's why people don't come talk to me anymore. They have found out that if it's rumors, if it's, hey, did you hear what's going on here? No, and I don't care. If that person wanted me to know, they would come and tell me. Or if I was supposed to know and they didn't want to tell me, Holy Ghost would just put them on my heart. May not tell me what's going on, but they know that I need. I know that I either need to go talk to them, or that I need to get into the altar and pray for them, or something. I, I'm not worried about it. You say, "Well, Brother Jordan, that's cold." I got things to do. It's not that I don't care. It's that I've got well doing to do. I got enough distractions with me. 
So you know what busybodies do? They bring everybody's distractions. He says, withdraw yourself. Separate them. Fact, verse number 12, he says, now them that are such, what? Busybodies. We command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work. You know what the opposite of busy is? Quiet. You know what the opposite of distraction is? Work. He says, we tell the busybodies, sit down, shut up, and get to work. That's the hillbilly version of it. He says, with quietness. Right? Just because it's your problem doesn't mean that everybody else has to know about it. Just because you have a problem doesn't mean that you get to tell everybody else. We all got problems. We all got distractions. I don't need the double distraction of what's going on over here plus hearing about what's distracting you. But you can't look to somebody else to resolve your distraction. He said cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. I read that Jesus being made a little bit lower than the angels right, endured all those things which came to man and is able to succor them as our high priest that run to him and ask Lord help me with this problem why because he's already overcome it I can't help you with your distraction but Jesus can I can't help you with that inconvenience in your life but guess who can Jesus these busybodies literally were walking around and saying well I couldn't this week because of this 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 and this and still expecting food God don't care about why you didn't. All he cares about is what you should have. There are no excuses when it comes to anything in your life. And so, Brother Jordan, that's cold-hearted. I read that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Anything less than overcoming Anything less than walking in them doors back there and being completely ready to worship. Anything less than throughout the week. Right? Being 100% committed to what the Lord has instructed me to do. What I believe the will of God for me to do in my life is. Anything less than that, unacceptable in the eyes of God. Because He promised to equip us, to enable us, and to do what we cannot do so that we can be victorious over the things. You know why we aren't? Because of distractions. Because of inconveniences. Because we dwell on those things that we don't want to... Th if you don't want to deal with it, why in the world are you thinking about it all the time? Right? If you hate it that much, why are you spending all your time thinking about it? He says... No, 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 no. Get down, quiet yourself, quiet your mind, quiet your life. Get alone with God and just get the work done. He says, talking about the work's not going to get the work done. Thinking about the work's not going to get the work done. Just go and get the work done. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Forms app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.